So I wanted to talk a little today about the assessment of acute ischemic stroke from now and forever on known as the brain attack. In this lecture, we'll go over a few basic definitions, some of the data behind using IVTPA for ischemic stroke, and spend the majority of the rest of the time on the assessment itself. We'll then speak a little bit about intraarterial therapy and other potential treatments when TPA isn't an option, and then finish with the acute management of stroke. A separate lecture will talk a little bit about workup for the underlying etiology. So let's start with the definition of ischemia so that we're all on the same page with terminology. Ischemia is any sudden neurological event resulting in an interruption of blood flow to the brain. When it's transient, it's referred to as a TIA, or transient ischemic attack, while permanent deficits are called strokes. Along with ischemic strokes, you can have primary intracranial hemorrhages, and these are managed entirely differently and have in a different set of common underlying etiologies that typically include hypertension, aneurysms, and vascular malformations. So we're gonna dedicate the rest of this talk to the treatment and workup of ischemia. As I said, a TIA is a transient ischemic attack, though some of your patients will call them mini strokes. In the right-hand corner of the screen, you can see a diffusion-weighted MRI where ischemia shows up as bright, right, as bright white. TIAs typically last 10 to 20 minutes and by definition leave no mark on MRI. So this patient's actually had a stroke, not a TIA. Uh, in reality, uh, neurologic events that last longer than 20 minutes usually show up on MRI because it's gotten so much more sensitive. This is an important distinction to make uh, for uh, categorizing patients, but in reality, it's a spectrum. Uh, it's kind of like the angia's, uh, angina's relationship to, MR, uh, to MI. Uh, a TIA is a major warning sign for stroke, and the risk of having a stroke in the days following the event are incredibly high, so they have to be managed the same way. Uh, Alternatively, intracerebral hemorrhage refers to bleeding in the brain, and it accounts for about 10% of all strokes. Uh, chronic hypertension is by far the most common cause. This slide lists the American Heart Association's stroke warning signs for patients. Uh, focal neurologic deficits such as numbness or tingling on one side of the body, aphasia, visual deficits, and dizziness. In general, it's important to point out that ischemic strokes don't typically cause headaches, though sometimes clots, particularly in the posterior circulation or dissections, can. But I think that for this slide, a sudden onset headache mainly refers to the worst headache of your life, to catch the subarachnoid hemorrhages. So when someone comes in with symptoms concerning for a stroke, why is there all the fuss? What's the rush? What treatments are available? IV tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, is currently the only FDA-approved treatment for acute ischemic stroke. It's the clot buster. Its use is supported by the NINDS trial that was published in 1995. Uh, just over 600 patients presented within three hours of the onset of their symptoms uh, concerning for acute ischemic stroke, and they were enrolled. Uh, for, um, with various stroke subtypes. The mean age was 60, the median NIH stroke scale was 14, so fairly severe, which is expected given the high rate of cardioembolic and large vessel disease. Compared to placebo, patients had better functional outcomes and lower rates of death, uh, though a 6% risk for symptomatic hemorrhagic transformation when they received IVTPA. The important thing to note about uh, the NINDS trial was that it was a two-part study. They looked at outcomes both at 24 hours and at 90 days. There was no difference in outcome at 24 hours, though we've all certainly seen the patient who's had an immediate improvement, and we can talk about the possible reasons for that another time. But there was a definite difference in functional outcome at 90 days, particularly when looking at the group who received treatment with IVTPA within 90 minutes of last seen normal. So it's all about time. So how does the process work? When an acute stroke is suspected, either by EMS or the emergency department, the BAT pager is activated. It goes to multiple individuals, the junior resident, the chief, the stroke coordinator, the charge nurse, the lab, and the pharmacy to let everyone know to mobilize because time is brain, and studies have shown that the faster treatment's given, the better people do. The goal 
door to needle time is 60 minutes, which means you have to be focused and efficient in your assessment. Probably by the time you arrive in the ED, the patient will have had a non-contrast head CT to rule out hemorrhage, clearly a contraindication to treatment with IV TPA. And vital signs are important for several reasons. The brain is really smart, so when it's not getting enough blood flow, it increases blood pressure to augment perfusion. So elevated blood pressure can actually be another piece of evidence for you that the patient's having a stroke. Also, though, if you're going to treat with TPA, the blood pressure has to be less than 180. Uh, since time is, uh, is of essence, we uh, try IV medications once, but if there's not an immediate response, I tend to move directly to an icardipine drip to achieve control. Laboratory values are sent and unfortunately can be the rate limiting step, particularly the coags. However, in patients that don't have a history of renal or liver disease and they're not on anticoagulation, there's good data to suggest that it's not necessary to wait for the INR or the PTTR. Uh, all this is happening while the junior is evaluating the patient. And this includes a brief history as to exactly what happened and an NIH stroke scale score, which uh, you'll hear a little about later. The goal is to figure out, number one, do I really think this person is having an ischemic event? And number two, are they a candidate for TPA? In order to get a TPA, it's ideal to have two large bore IVs and a Foley. Um, however, uh, you, we do not let Foley's hold up uh, administration. One of the most critical pieces of information to establish upfront is the time of onset, or more accurately for TPA, the time last seen normal. This is not when deficits were first discovered, but instead when the patient was last normal. Sometimes the patient can tell you themselves exactly when things started, but often you have to get a family member or another observer involved. If they were observed by their caregiver an hour ago, uh, normal and, and found 10 minutes ago with aphasia, the time of onset was an hour ago. If they went to bed normal the night before and then awoke with weakness, there's technically no way to know when their symptoms first started and last normal is the night before. Now the caveat is that in the cardiac literature we know that MI wakes people from sleep and there is an increasing suspicion that this also happens with stroke. So we have a trial here both at Hopkins and Bayview called Salon where we administer IV TPA to people who present within four and a half hours of waking up with their symptoms. We've had really good outcomes so far but it's not routine standard of care. So what are the absolute contraindications to IV TPA? The first is being outside the window, and that's because we have good data that shows that the longer you are from symptom onset, the more likely you are to have hemorrhagic conversion and the worse outcome after IV TPA. Clearly, you wouldn't be a TPA candidate if you have a hemorrhage of any variety. Minor symptoms, such as an NIH stroke scale less than 4, or rapidly resolving deficits is tricky, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Vascular malformations in the brain are more likely to bleed, as well as infectious emboli, and there's poor data regarding safety in pregnant and postpartum women. These were other previously published relative contraindications uh, to TPA, but in each case the risks must be weighed against the potential benefit. People hesitate to treat kids less than 18, though we are working on establishing a pediatric program. We've seen more bleeding in older individuals, but we also know that they have a bigger benefit when they get TPA in terms of improved outcomes. Early CT changes, which I'll show you in a minute, indicate that there's already some territory that's infarcted, leaving friable vasculature that's more prone to bleeding. Low platelets or high coags, history of recent surgeries, especially involving non-compressible sites, uh, prior intracranial hemorrhage really depends on circumstances. If they had a little ICH 10 years ago uh, and their blood pressure was out of control then and since they've been doing really well, that's very different than amyloid angiopathy that's resulted in recurrent hemorrhages. These are all issues you'll no doubt be discussing with your chief as well as the stroke attending while trying to figure out your patient's individual bleeding risk. So how can CT help? Uh, and what did I mean when I said early uh, CT signs of ischemia. Well, this here is called a hyperdense MCA sign. It represents a clot within the MCA territory. It's important because it, number one, confirms stroke, but also because if the clot's really that extensive, it's possible that even with IV TPA, it won't completely resolve. And in the right patient, such as a young, uh, good premorbid condition uh, person, they may benefit from additional intraarterial intervention.
along with a hyperdense MCA sign, sometimes you can see clot further out in the MCA, uh, known as the MCA dot sign. On this CT, you're beginning to see loss of gray-white differentiation. Here's some sulcal effacement. Do you see how the definition is somewhat blurred on the right compared to the left? And here on the right, you see a loss of differentiation of the lenticular nuclei. It looks fuller and less well-defined than on the other side. On this CT, you can see a frank hypodensity. If they're supposedly within the first three hours, you should be suspicious, as stroke typically begins to appear on CT four to six hours after symptom onset. You may want to clarify last seen normal one more time. So initially, IV TPA was approved for three hours from symptom onset. In 2008, the results of ECAS-3 were published in the New England Journal, and this showed that it was safe up to four and a half hours from symptom onset. Brat performed a meta-analysis of all the TPA trials performed, as many of the early trials were, neg uh, were negative and they treated people much, much further out, uh, which is probably why they didn't have positive results. He divided the time interval to treatment into 90-minute intervals, 0 to 90, 91 to 180, etc., and analyzed the ratio of patients with favorable outcomes, which he defined as a modified ranking of 0 to 1. Uh, and he did this for 27 176 patients. So he found a significant correlation of outcome from uh, with time from symptom onset. And the odds ratios for favorable outcome were 2.83, 1.53, 1.4, and 1.16 respectively. Uh, you can see here that uh, after you get to about four and a half hours out, your odds for a good outcome is overshadowed uh, by risk for bleeding. So ECAS was performed in Europe, where they have a particular set of inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. And this included uh, no patients over the age of 80, and you were excluded if you had diabetes and a prior symptomatic stroke. Uh, so these are technically the criteria that people will quote when they consider treating someone within the four and a half hour window, because this was the group of patients in which administration was shown to be safe. Uh, however, newer publications are suggesting that these criteria may not all be necessary, and, um, and on a case-by-case -case basis, we will often, for example, treat someone over the age of 80. I mentioned that in considering TPA, you mun might run into some tricky situations. The first, and most common, is the low NIH stroke scale score, or rapidly improving symptoms. So IV TPA is not without risk. There's up to a 6% risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. And that's why some people defer giving the medication if the NIH stroke scale score is low or the symptoms are rapidly improving. I think the most important thing to consider is whether you actually believe what the person has is due to ischemia as opposed to migraine. If I believe that it's a stroke and they get points for weakness, I'm often inclined to give the TPA. Aphasia-only presentations are uh, often problematic, mainly because they usually represent a mimic, such as a migraine, seizure, or delirium. That's why your chief will often push you to uh, find a hard finding, such as a visual field deficit or a subtle facial droop. Finally, the time of onset uh, can be unclear or it can be hard to sort out in someone who has an old stroke, whether deficits are new or just worse, for example, if they have another overlying infection. When in doubt, we tend to err on the conservative side of foregoing the TPA, though acute MR imaging can be useful in some circumstances. It should not be uh, used routinely to make the diagnosis. The decision to give TPA is based on the clinical presentation. MRI takes time. Now that we've talked about the assessment of acute stroke, it's important to point out that not all neurologic deficits, especially transient ones, are due to primary vascular causes. And the differential diagnosis should always include mimics. Uh, vascular uh, events tend to be maximal at onset and occur in patients with risk factors. Uh, TIAs, as pointed out earlier, tend to be short-lived.
So what are some of the common mimics that we should consider? So hypoglycemia can actually produce focal deficits and look exactly like a stroke. However, this improves when the patient's given D50. A focal seizure starts with limb shaking and often staring. However, the following Todd's paralysis and eye deviation can also look like a stroke. Migraine with aura is always on the differential and can be tricky to diagnose, but the population is normally different. For example, a 30-year-old woman with a history of headaches compared to the 65-year-old man with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease. Things like tumors, abscesses, and subdural hematomas typically also have a different time course but can have similar symptoms. One of the main differentiating features of vascular events is the time course and the progression of symptoms. So TIAs, like I was saying, tend to be maximal at onset, and they resolve after about 15 to 20 minutes. Seizures typically march, or at least they can, initially involving the hand, for example, then climbing up the arm to the face, following the humunculus along the motor strip, and they only last two to three minutes. Migraines can also uh, evolve, but they tend to do so over 30 minutes to an hour, and they're often followed by a headache. There are also features that should alert you that something else may be going on other than ischemia. Um, so rarely, other than a basal occlusion, does a TIA present as a loss of consciousness, and usually it's not stereotyped, occurring over and over and over again in exactly the same way, without resulting in per, uh, persistent deficits. So you've assessed and decided that your patient's having a stroke and that uh, they're a TPA candidate. TPA is administered as an initial bolus, and the rest of it is given over an hour. Let's talk a little bit about the complications. So intracerebral hemorrhage is the major complication that we worry about and counsel patients on. The risk is 4 to 6%, depending on the trial, uh, but you can further risk stratify people. So much of the risk is actually driven by size of the infarct. So higher NIH stroke scale scores typically indicate larger strokes and higher risk. Edema, or mass effect on CT, uh, as well as uh, prolonged time from onset, indicate that there's a larger area that's gone on to infarct and a larger area of dead tissue to bleed into. With TPA, the blood pressure monitoring is intensive, and this helps to minimize the risk of bleeding into your stroke. So non-CNS bleeding can also occur, and it's typically GI or GU related. A rare but serious complication is the development of angioedema. It usually occurs about 30 minutes after the onset of a fusion, infusion, and it's unilateral, contralateral to the side of the lesion, just like the stroke. It's important to treat early and aggressively to avoid the need for intubation if possible. Finally, cardiac tamponade has been reported, uh, though it's incredibly rare, with only five cases uh, reported for stroke specifically. Uh, it is something to think about, however, particularly in patients with a recent MI. When someone has a bleeding complication, uh, TPA must be reversed. So we have a procedure that includes uh, FFP, cryo, and platelets. So what happens when a patient's having a stroke but isn't a candidate for TPA? Sometimes we consider intraarterial intervention, where we go in and mechanically remove the clot with a device. You may have heard of the solitaire or the penumbra. These are invasive procedures and are only done if we think the patient will truly benefit. We evaluate it by using uh, MR imaging to determine what the ischemic penumbra looks like or the area that's at risk but is not yet dead. You can see here on top a relatively small area of infarct, the bright on diffusion weighted imaging. That area is already infarcted and there's nothing we can do at this point to save it. But below, uh, there's a larger perfusion deficit, the blue. Um, Making up, uh, taking up the majority of the MCA territory. Perfusion imaging measures blood flow, or how long it takes for the blood to get to that area of the brain. If the flow is too slow, eventually that area will die, but we still have some time left because it's not already infarcted on the diffusion. The fact that there is a diffusion-perfusion mismatch makes this person a good candidate for further intervention, as we're likely to see some uh, improvement if we go in and open the vessel. Intraarterial intervention is not the only option that we have, as it carries risk of hemorrhage, dissection, uh, recurrent stroke, etc. 
we actually uh, loaded the previous patient with Plavix to figuratively grease the wheels a little bit and let blood get through the stenotic area. And then we augmented their perfusion by allowing uh, their blood pressure to rise to systolics in the 200s. This is also called permissive hypertension. Sometimes we'll even give pressors to induce hypertension, though this can be hard on the cardiovascular system, so it's not done as frequently as it used to be. Uh, but with, medical, with just these medical interventions and not anything else, this patient's speech actually markedly improved, and they recovered quite well. The management of patients with acute stroke when they're transferred from the ED to the floor is very important. As I alluded to before, the brain's really smart and automatically increases blood pressure when it's not getting enough blood flow. So we allow permissive hypertension up to the 200s uh, systolic uh, if they're not uh, showing evidence of cardiovascular compromise, such as chest pain, EKG changes. In general, that means holding their home uh, antihypertensive medications. The only caveat to this is beta blockers. You can easily push a patient into AFib with RVR or induce rebound tachycardia. So I'll sometimes half them or I'll just restart them as they're not the best blood pressure medications anyway. We start all stroke patients on an antiplatelet typically aspirin and a statin. Aspirin is held for 24 hours if they get TPA. Uh, now, controlling hyperglycemia and fever are crucial to helping preserve the ischemic penumbra. Um, however, remember that hypoglycemia can kill a patient, and many of your stroke patients will be NPO, so the standard sliding scale insulin is just fine. There's no need to go crazy. Intensive neuromonitoring with frequent checks by the nurses um, is crucial to pick up clinical worsening early, and all patients are placed on continuous telemetry. With TPA, the blood pressure monitoring is uh, intensive, and as I said before, this helps to minimize the risk of symptomatic ICH due to hypertension. Our goal is typically less than 180.